Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. This is a fun show. Of course, you know, a lot of our shows are either medical or financial. We do have some entertainment, but we don't have too many travel. But when I saw this weekend in Havana with Jeffrey Bear, I said, we have to do this for our listeners. Welcome to our show, Jeffrey. Oh, it's great to be here. Now, you know, this is an interesting thing. So had you gone to Havana before you did this years ago or ever? Never. Never in my life. So the first time I went to Havana was uh, in the sweltering heat of August last year where we went for eight days to survey locations and meet people. And then we went back for 16 days to film um, in November and December of last year. Oh, great. Well, I lived in Miami most of my life. And as much as I wanted to go to Havana, somehow, maybe between having kids and other things, I never got mm-hmm. there. So I, <laughs> you know, that which is really strange. So I'm so sure, so excited, though, that Havana is open. But if I were to go to Havana, I'd want to go with a group. I don't think I'd want to go by myself. Oh, I think that's the best way to go, frankly. Well, it depends on, um, it depends on the kind of uh, tolerance you have for adventure, I guess. But, yeah, I think a group is a, is a fantastic way to go. So, okay, so tell me, uh, I'm going to let you talk about this. Tell me how you felt about it, what you loved, especially as a and as someone who really appreciates architecture and and you've traveled everywhere. Just you go ahead and and take us on your trip. Oh well, it it was definitely a feast for all the senses. That is, there's no question about that. And 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 you're right. I I particularly love architecture. A lot of my work has been about architecture and. So one of the three people, so the, the premise of the show is it's sort of three people giving me a, a deep immersion in the history and culture of C- Cuba, generally, but really Havana. And one of the people who shows me around is this wonderful, hip, young uh, restoration architect who's who's made it sort of his, his passion and his mission in life to, to try to... Um, Restore so many of these important historic buildings that are all around you in Havana. So much of Havana, you know, uh, is crumbling. Um, it's it's a cliche, but it's it's you know it's actually true. Um, uh, the old colonial part of the city, um, you know, you'll find like right next door to each other um, a magnificently restored colonial era building, and then another one right next door to it with no no roof. And um, and yet, um, by the way, I'm on a street in New York right now because we're filming. It's in New York, another show in New York. That's what you're hearing in the background. Um, uh, you know, there'll be like no roof on the building, and yet 22 families will be living on the lower floors. Mm-hmm. This is actually something we feature in our show. Danielle De La Regatta, the restoration architect, first takes me to a, a beautifully restored colonial era courtyard building with a fountain, and you really see how people in the colonial era lived, including the mezzanine section where the slaves lived. Um, and then we go right around the corner to the same kind of building, but it is complete ruin, and yet people are still living in it. Um, and then you see these layers of, of eras of history from the earliest, earliest fortresses uh, built in the in the 1600s with this stone that has has sea you know fossilized sea creatures embedded in it. It's the local stone, um, all the way through the the, the buildings from the um, the Baroque and neoclassical uh, really period when Havana was just booming in the 19th century, early 20th century. There was prohibition in the U.S. and people were going to Havana because they could buy alcohol and they could gamble. A lot of American mobsters were were building Havana and companies like Bacardi Rum. And then you see the Soviet era where there's all these kind of imposing sort of minimal, brutalist blockhouse sort of buildings that like like housing blocks and things like that. Um, and then and then this really nineteen fifties kind of modernist architecture that you see in various states of repair and disrepair. So it's an amazing immersion. Well, I was thinking as you were talking uh, in Miami Beach, of course, we know about Art Deco and how uh, thankfully they did preserve that. You think they'll preserve a lot of Cuba? So that is going to be an extremely difficult challenge because so much of it 
is in disrepair because of um, you know so many years of the uh, uh, of the political situation and the embargo. Um, there just hasn't been a lot of money. Um, the the core colonial part of the city is under the this is fascinating actually um, is under the jurisdiction of uh, an amazing character named the um, historian of the city, which um, sounds like he's, he's, he's just interested in, in sort of um, telling the historical story, but actually, and his name is Eusebio um, uh, Leal Spengler, um, he, he has built an entire um, infrastructure, um, uh, human infrastructure, ar- around restoring the colonial city, and there has been funding for that. So little by little, they've been. They, we, we go to this school where they're training apprentices in lost arts of plaster work and and stone carving, um, and they're they're slowly putting together, uh, putting back together many of the buildings in the colonial part of the city. And and the historian's office actually also runs schools, daycare centers, and all the a lot of the tourist money gets plowed back into the office of the historian to do more restoration. So there's sort of a business model there. Um, and it's been remarkably successful. Um, one of the, the four main plazas, uh, Plaza Vieja, the old plaza, which is actually the newest plaza, um, has been fully restored, all four sides of it. And the center where there used to be a parking garage is gone, and it's, the fountain is back, and it's been restored. <laughs> so there is restoration going on. But right next to that district is... Um, um, the Centro, it's called Havana Centro, which is Central Havana, um, which dates more from the 1800s, I would say, early 1900s, and just vast swaths of that um, is just it, in a shambles. Um, and you look at it and you just think, how on earth could this ever be restored? Um, it's it's going to be a huge, huge challenge. They're doing a lot with infrastructure. We we filmed, um, you know, digging new sewers and things. Um, they're they're trying, but um, it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of time. And who knows if that will, if I, if, if any of that will ever really be possible. And of course, possible. and of course, Cuba, uh, like Haiti, is really the path of <laughs> the hurricane season. <laughs> yeah, and actually, uh, you know, we got a we we had we had every kind of catastrophe that could happen to us while we were filming and one of one of which was um uh, this is a bit of a digression but one of one of those is that four days before we were supposed to start filming in cuba uh fidel castro died and we thought we were going to have to delay everything because the whole country was in mourning uh there wasn't they didn't allow any music in the streets and so forth so just when we we went anyway and we were able to start filming and just when the mourning period ended uh, we had great weather. This what what felt like a typhoon descended on Havana, and we thought, boy, you know, now we can't film. But then we thought, no, this is part of the story. As you said, the weather is it, 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 these buildings take a huge pounding from the salt sea air, and so we thought, let's go out and film. And our cameraman wrapped, wrapped his very very expensive camera in a bunch of trash bags <laughs> and uh, we went out on the Nalecon, which is the, the seawall the waterfront seawall and i put on my raincoat and we were insane i mean nobody was out in this weather and and i was walking along the seawall and we were kind of waiting for the waves to come over the side of the seawall and pound me uh for the you know because it would make a good a good picture of course and i got and I got pounded, but so did the camera. So oh we had to go back. We had to go back and dry out the camera. But there is a section in the show where we do show um, how much flooding and salt sea air and waves the toll that that takes on the buildings there as well. Exactly. And I did hear something recently. I think it was on an NPR that people. The worst thing if they're going to the, the government is now going to either delay or not let Americans go there. They worried about their cigars. Now, I see where you visited the cigar mm-hmm. area, right? Tell us about that. Well, uh, now, I have to tell you, I personally did not do that. Um, we uh, had a web team down there with us as well, and we just couldn't cover every aspect of the story. So it was our web team that went to the cigar factory. So I have to defer to them or maybe tell people just to, once the show airs after July 18th, look on the website 
pbs.org weekend in havana and you can see a web feature about the cigar business but i personally did well i will tell you one funny story we wanted to make one shot of me with the cliche you know smoking a cigar right i am not a smoker <laughs> uh, the last time i smoked a cigar was about 40 years ago and uh, we got it all set up out in a cafe on a plaza. And I couldn't even light the thing. The, one of our, our Cuban crew was laughing their heads off. They finally, you know, one of our Cuban guys came over and sort of showed me how to twirl the cigar and light it. And, and I couldn't even keep the thing lit. We finally abandoned the shot because I looked like <laughs> such an idiot trying to smoke this cigar. Oh, I didn't know. Th- I thought it's like a cigarette. You just light it. Oh, no, you don't do that? It's it no, it's a challenge. You got to snip off one end, and then you have to kind of twirl it in your mouth while you're puffing, and and get a nice even glow on the end of it. And then if you don't like puff it right, it just goes out. So that um, see that's something a, a lot of us don't know. But let and then I know that you did you do a side trip to Hemingway, to Hemingway's oh, area. Oh, definitely, yeah, ah. absolutely, yeah. That's not wasn't a side trip. That's actually a very. Uh, a big part of the of the program. Uh, we spent uh, a day out there filming, and actually, we filmed in two places. We filmed at Hemingway's house, which is a magnificent um, hilltop house that he bought with the proceeds from "For Whom the Bell Tolls," and uh, it's now preserved as a museum. And you actually aren't even allowed inside, so you see us kind of peering in through the doors. Um, at, at first, we thought we were going to be allowed inside. But as with everything in Cuba, there's a lot of bureaucracy, and one person tells you one thing, and somebody tells you something else. And we got there, all ready to film inside, and the woman said, oh, no, you're not allowed inside. And we were very upset. But then it turned out that it was much better, because it looks like we're sort of peeping toms. We're sort of peering in (laughs) through his windows. um, I love it. And and looking in on his life. He's got the whole house. He's got all these um, heads of, of animals that he killed on safaris. Um, all over the walls, and in his bathroom um, are are the the animals his cat killed, like a, a like a, uh, a a lizard, you know, in formaldehyde. So his cat's trophies are there as well. And the other thing that's kind of amazing is he was obsessed with his weight. So on the wall, there's a scale in the bathroom, and on the wall, in his own handwriting, uh, every day he recorded his weight. Um, which was really kind of an odd thing to see. Amazing. Um, but anyway, th- yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that was his house. But then, you know, just as, as um, magical for me was we went to um, think, uh, we went to uh, Ko- Ko- Kohima, which is the fishing village where he kept his his fishing boat Pilar. Um, and it's uh, we, I, I actually got on a boat and and they filmed me. Uh, sort of motoring into the harbor um, amongst all these fishermen with their ramshackle fishing boats pulled up on the, uh, on the shore. Um, and, and in a, you know, classic Cuban story, the, the boat that I, that, that, that we found for me to, to, to uh, be filmed on the captain, it's just an old, you know, kind of old fishing boat. The captain told me that um, it's actually the engine came was, was, um, salvaged from a Czechoslovakian forklift truck. Huh. They, you know, they're very, very resourceful and creative in Cuba because they, they just have to get things from wherever they can get them. And so, you know, a lot of these old 1950s cars. Yeah, I was going to ask you have, about that because it seems yeah. like now everyone's thinking about getting going down there and stealing them. Well, they're not going to, are they? Stealing them, you said? Meaning for a very inexpensive price. They're, oh, they're, now these are gems. Them, yeah. These are gems. Yeah, they are gems. Frankly, I don't know if you could buy one. Maybe you could. But, um, uh, you know, I thought these American cars were, again, another thing that was just going to be for the tourists. I thought that, that, you know, it's just a bunch of cars for tourists. You see them everywhere. And in all states of repair and disrepair, you know, they really are. Those and, like, old Soviet cars like Lada's. Those are pretty much what people are driving around in. Um, and in our film, we go to a uh, repair shop where they literally restore these cars. But restore is almost the wrong word. They kind of rebuild them from from the ground up. They they stitch new upholstery for them on, on vintage sewing machines. They hammer new side panels and things for the for the cars themselves. They paint them. 
the engines are either restored or, or, or salvaged from other vehicles, and, uh, and they make a lot of the parts for the engines. I mean, they're very resourceful. They've really learned how to keep things going there. So I was thinking as you were talking about the Hemingway House, Jeffrey, here in Key West, I'm sure you've seen the one down there. I actually have. I, I'm a sailboat racer, and <laughs> I, I, I'm i from Chicago. I live in Chicago, but I, I was down there for the Key West race a few years ago. I raced in it. And um, um, the captain of our boat was such a such a jerk that one day I said, forget it, I'm not sailing with you anymore. <laughs> and I... I did the I did the tourist scene instead, and we did see the Hemingway House in Key West. Yeah. So it, is it different than what you saw? I mean, this smaller. I mean, this was where he lived most of the time. So the one in Havana. He, did he spend that much time? Yeah, there? the Holman. He's considered a Cuban writer to Cubans. He lived in Havana longer the longer than he lived anywhere else. Ah. Um, so I don't actually know, um, you know, how long he lived in that house in Key West, or if it really captures his personality as much as the house in Havana. I'm just not, I, I'm not familiar enough with the one in Key West to know, but the one in Havana, you know, really captures his personality. There are bookshelves in every room. Just <laughs> the whole house is like a library. And of course, a lot of um, bars in the house too, including one he designed himself, liquor cabinets. Uh, so it really, and, and uh, now his boat Pilar has been restored and it's under a roof and preserved on that site as well. So I don't, I don't know if that's the same in the one in Key West, at the one in Key West or not. Next time I go there, I'm going to have to check it out. But I want everyone who's enjoying this show as much as I am, frankly, to know when they're going to be able to see this. So it's Tuesday. It starts. The premiere is, it's called Weekend in Havana with Jeffrey Baer, B-A-E-R. It premieres Tuesday, July 18th from 8 to 9 p.m., and you'll have to check your local listing. Of, it's on PBS. and also, Right, this will be, yes, coast-to-coast coast on PBS. Right, so that's wonderful. And I just want to ask you, so there's a thing that you, it's part of a PBS Summer of Adventure. Is this something that you do for them? Uh, we are just, we, we are lucky to be a part of the Summer of, of Adventure on PBS. Uh, we contributed this one show, Weekend in Havana, but all summer long on Tuesday nights, uh, PBS is doing various travel shows. I know one of them is in Alaska. Um, and then um, another series, which, you know, we're in the middle of right now. So when this airs, it may already have finished, but it's the story of China. Interestingly, the producer, the wonderful gifted producer, Leo Eaton, who was our producer director um, on this show, um, also was the, the uh, executive producer of Summer of uh, of uh, the story of China. So um, we've been calling this the summer of Leo because he's got so many of his shows on PBS this summer. Well, you're a, you're quite a talent and you and you sound so enthusiastic. So you love everything you do, but this one sounds, do you speak Spanish? You know what? I do not. I, I got <laughs> Rosetta Stone, you know, that, that yes. uh, teach yourself right. Spanish. And for about three months, I made a very uh, unsuccessful attempt to uh, learn how to speak Spanish um, and I was troubled by that. I was worried that, you know, how can I tell the story of Havana with integrity when I don't speak Spanish? Um, but, you know, really the, the role that I play in this show is, is kind of like the surrogate for Americans who might be curious, uh, might not really know anything ahead of time, uh, about going down to Cuba. And, and the, the upside of it, I guess, was that for me, um, it was all new, and it was all discoveries of things I didn't know, and and you really see that. I mean, my reactions are quite honest um, on camera. I'm 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 very uh, charmed and amazed and sobered by by the things that I see. I'm sort of learning it as you're learning it. Right. We also uh, there, there's two other people in the two other tour guides uh, who take me around. Um, this amazing um, dancer. Um, Irene Rodriguez, who has a flamenco dance troupe in uh, Havana, and uh, then this just incredible uh, Afro-Cuban jazz uh, piano player, Roberto Fonseca. And we go, in, in one scene, we go to the recording studio in Havana, where people like um, uh, Nat King Cole and Benny Moray and the Buena Vista Social Club recorded, and and I sit down at the piano with him, and 
and two of his musicians. I'm surrounded by this Afro-Cuban music. Um, it's such an immersion, and it was a very emotional thing for me. I, I Up until that moment when we filmed, I was kind of feeling like, okay, I'm in Cuba, this is all really cool, but it's also kind of foreign and weird. And, and after we walked out of that studio, Havana just looked different to me. I don't know, something about the immersion in that music just went right into my soul. And, and, and literally, when I came out, Havana looked different to me. Well, Jeffrey, I um, felt that way the first time I saw the story of the Buena Vista Social Club and that exciting opportunity for them to go to Lincoln Center. I mean, that was, I couldn't get over that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this piano player, Roberto Fonseca, after, uh, I can't remember his name, after the piano player who was the, with the original Buena Vista Social Club passed away, uh, Roberto, who's a young guy, was invited to be the piano player and tour with the Buena Vista Social Club. Uh-huh. Um, and so, um, you know, he's the real deal. Uh, and it was it was thrilling to um, to just be there with him. Plus, he also is a um, Santeria priest. Santeria is this um, religion that was brought to uh, Cuba by the slaves. Uh, well, actually, it was kind of created by the slaves. The slave owners didn't want them worshiping the African deities, so they invented this religion that looked like Christianity, but secretly they were really worshiping the African deities. And so we went to a uh, ruined slave plantation in one scene with Roberto, and he sort of talks me through the whole history of Santeria uh, as well. So, you know, he, he we got uh, more from him than, than only music. Well, that was taking, uh, that, that was perfect. I mean, you did get so many things that were unexpected. I see that. As much as you can plan a TV show, radio shows and all, it's the unexpected sometimes if you make, you know, if you make use of it, it, it's really great. Well, I don't want people not to, to turn to this. So my guest is Jeffrey Baer, B-A-E-R. And please, do you remember this is Pencil Talk Radio. We talk, we talk about a lot of things. This is one you need to write down somewhere, Tuesday, July the 18th, at 8 o'clock on PBS. You're going to want to see this. It's going to be so much fun. I know I, I whatever I'm doing, I'm going to be watching it, uh, Jeffrey, because you certainly did something uh, special. So I also wanted to talk about the baseball. You know, we get some of our finest baseball players from Cuba. Is that still going Absolutely. on? Oh, without question. Um, uh, you know, we have many, many fine Cuban baseball players in the U.S., and uh, baseball is huge down there. And we really, really, you know, you talk about how um, uh, the, the unexpected um, we we really wanted to film a baseball scene while we were down there. Well, it turned out that the industria, industrialists, basically, the, the, the Havana professional baseball team, had already um, been eliminated from the playoffs when we were there. So their, their stadium was closed, and they weren't playing. So then we thought, okay, Little League. So we lined up a Little League game, and then that was the day of the typhoon that hit. <laughs> so they were completely washed out, and we had to cancel that. But when we were at Hemingway's house, think of here, it, you know, Hemingway coached a, a Little League team. Aww. And the, the, field, the field is still there where he coached the team. And all of a sudden, this guy walks up to us wearing a Chicago Cubs baseball hat. I'm from Chicago. And our uh, executive producer, Dan Soule, who, um, whose parents fled Cuba uh, at the start of the revolution, and he speaks Spanish, started chatting with this guy because Dan is also from Chicago, um, and he noticed the Cubs hat, and the guy said, oh, I, I coach kids um, right here on Ernest Hemingway's baseball field. Come back tomorrow. Not so possible. Not we drove <laughs> back the next day, and there they all were, and um, and it was magical. It was ab- I mean, I, I, I'm a baseball nut, and I, you know, I had my baseball glove on, and I'm throwing the ball back and forth, and Hitting, uh, hitting ground balls and fly balls to these kids, and it's and it's kids of all ages. This guy coaches these kids to basically keep them off the street, and it goes everywhere from a five-year-old kid who we got a shot of him running to first base, and halfway there he falls down, and then he gets up, and he gets up and starts running to second base by mistake, and everybody's pointing him back to first oh base. God. Everything, everything from that to a kid who to me looked like he was about sixteen, and you could tell this kid idolizes these heroes who've gone to the U.S. or who play on the, the top Cuban baseball teams. 
he was completely dressed like a professional ball player with the with the um, baseball pants, tight fitting baseball pants, and the 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 baseball cap with the wraparound sunglasses. You know, stylishly point. You know, uh, on the top of the brim, and that kid threw a ball to me, and it smacked into my mitt. We actually have this in the film, and I. I just looked right at the camera and said, watch for this kid. I'm just going to say that. Remember his name, right? Yeah. I mean, he was he was really something. That was one of my favorite days uh, down in Cuba was that day I got to throw the ball around with those those. Uh, You're just having Cuban too much fun, players. Jeffrey. I mean, this is a great <laughs> thing for you. And I don't want to uh, st- I don't want to lose the show until I talk to you about Tropicana because I remember, the one thing I do remember when I lived in Miami was they were very risque down there before anything was allowed like this, even at the Latin Quarter here in Miami Beach. But they Uh did some real, uh, I I guess I would even call it pornographic things in some of those clubs. Are you aware of that? Well, in in Cuba, you mean? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, the mob ran a lot of these places. I have to tell you, I don't know specifically if they ran the Tropicana or not. But... um, you know, this kind of forbidden pleasure right. <laughs> was part of the appeal of right. Cuba in the just prior to the revolution. So from like the Prohibition era through the 1950s, Cuba was America's uh, Havana and specifically was you know, America's kind of America's playground. And there was it's a little bit like, you know, in the earlier days uh, you know, of Las Vegas, you know, right, what, right. What, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Right. Um, I mean, Cuba was Vegas before before it was Vegas. When when the revolution happened, that's when all the mobsters took the same I thing and, and brought it to um, Las Vegas, including cabaret shows. You know, we think of those showgirls as Las Vegas showgirls, but Las Vegas showgirls are really Havana, Cuba showgirls. You know, there it started in Havana. Well, you now, know, when we were at the, we, you oh, know what, ahead. we've run out of time, and I'm being canceled here. But I have to tell you. I have your number now, and I want to stay in touch with you. You are a great interview, and and I'm just so happy that this happened. So thank you. Good luck. I'll be watching the show. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks, Jeffrey. Bye.